In this video, we're going to work several problems which require the chain rule for differentiation. So if you're not familiar with the chain rule at all, you might want to check out my introductory video on that topic, and you'll find a link to that video underneath this one. Otherwise, just follow along here, and by the end of this video, you should have figured out how the chain rule works. So in this video, I want to focus on a practical use of the chain rule. I want to apply the chain rule to these different functions, these different scenarios, and just so we can figure out how to use it in those different situations, rather than getting too bogged down in the theory. If you want to start with the theory, check out that previous video, that introductory video, and then come back into this one. But let's start with a little reminder about what the chain rule is and how it works. The chain rule is a rule we use to differentiate composite functions. Remember, a composite function is when you've basically got a function inside another function, usually two functions. It can be more, but almost always we're going to be working with two functions. And certainly in this video, I'm going to be working with two functions. The problem with composite functions is that they can manifest in a whole bunch of different forms. These are all examples of composite functions, but as you can see, they look very different from one another. So the challenge with the chain rule is not only knowing how to use the rule, but knowing the scenarios in which you can use the rule. And the truth is that will take a little experience, but the key is to look for what you think might be a composite function, a function inside a function. And there's several ways that you will learn to sort of detect that scenario. So one common scenario that would fit that bill would be something in a bracket, some function in a bracket with a power on the bracket, like these guys here, or a trig function. All of the trig functions are some version of the chain rule. So that's what we're going to work on here. But before we get into these problems, let's have a quick reminder of what the chain rule says. Well, you can write the chain rule in a bunch of different ways. I'm not going to get too bogged down in the notation in this class, but let's just say we've got some way of representing our derivative. So let's go for dy dx. Usually the chain rule will be written something like dy dx equals dy du or some other letter times du dx. Now, without giving too much background to this, that might be not entirely clear as to what that's saying, but essentially what it's saying is that if u is a function of x, and importantly, u is your internal function, so the function that's inside the composite. With a composite, you've always got an inside, an internal function, and an outer function. And in the case of this scenario here, the u function, which is a function of x, is the inner function. Well, what the chain rule really says, regardless of the notation you use, is that to find your overall derivative for each of these functions, you're essentially taking the derivative of the, the y, which is the outer function, and multiplying it to the derivative of the u, which is the inner function. That is effectively what the chain rule says. It says differentiate twice, once for the outer function, once for the inner function, and then just multiply those together. And if you can do some tidying up at the end, then great, go for it. Now, there's two ways to approach the chain rule. You can either approach it formulaically, like this here, using all the letters, which can get a little cumbersome, or you can approach it more intuitively, the way I've just described, essentially just taking two derivatives, multiplying them together. Now, it could be that your teacher or the course that you're taking will mandate that you have to use the formal method. So I'm going to work this first example using a formal method, and then the others I just want to work using a more intuitive method. You get the same answer both ways. They're both correct. One is the longhand version, and one is the shorthand version, I guess. So let's start with this guy here. So if you are going to use this formula, or some equivalent to this formula, then you need to start by defining your u function. So we would say something like let u equal, and u is always going to equal the internal function. So the internal function here is 3x plus 2. So u equals 3x plus 2. And now we can just start to build up the things that we want. So we want du dx. So we've got our u in terms of x, so we can go ahead and differentiate. So du dx using the power rule is just going to be equal to 3. Because we've now defined 3x plus 2 to be u, then we can actually say that this y function here is not 3x plus 2 to the power of 4, but just u to the power of 4. So now we've got y expressed in terms of u, which is what we need to find our dy du. So taking that, well, I'll just write it here. So that means that we can express 
dy du, again, just using the power rule as 4u to the power of 3. Now, the chain rule says that once you've got these two derivatives, you just multiply them together. So that then says our dy dx is equal to dy du, which is this guy here, 4u cubed, multiplied to du dx, which is 3, which is like this which just gives us 12u to the power of 3. The only thing we've now got to do is back substitute with the, the u to put it back in terms of x to get a final answer of 12, replacing the u with 3x plus 2, and then putting the power of 3 on there. So that's fine. That's a formal method. That might be how your teacher is going to demand that you use the chain rule, but it's very long-winded and there's a lot of different letters going on and it can be a little cumbersome and a little confusing. So let's move on from there and think more intuitively about what the chain rule is really saying and how we can use it in a more um, straightforward, I guess, sort of fashion. Because if you look at this function here, what we've actually done is differentiate the inside to get a three, which is that. We've dif differentiated the whole bracket to get four times the bracket to the power of three, which is effectively that, and multiply them together to make that four and that three turn into a 12. So we can do it in a far more intuitive way. Let's take a look at this guy here. The first thing is this is not in a differentiable form, so we're gonna have to remove that root uh, to turn it into a fractional power. So our f of x here, and this is true in any differentiation scenario, you've always, regardless of whether it's chain rule, power rule, any other rule, you've got to check whether it's in a differentiable form. This is not in a differentiable form, so at this point, this is nothing to do with the chain rule, uh, but this is a very typical chain rule scenario, so we're just gonna put it in a form which is even differentiable, just by changing the square root to a one-half power, because there's already a power of three there, that's gonna become not a one-half, but three-halves, or three over two. So that is now in a differentiable form, and notice that the form of this is pretty close to the form of this, one of the typical chain rule scenarios where you've got a function inside a bracket and some power on the bracket. Now, I'm gonna abandon all of the letters and the stuff going on here and just go straight to the answer, um, which is maybe a little, maybe a little naughty, but um, you know, I think it's good to learn to do these intuitively as well. So we can go straight to the answer in this case, in this notation f prime of x, just by multiplying, well, using the power rule, I guess, on the whole bracket, the whole outer function, and then taking the derivative using the power rule on the internal function and multiplying them together. Differentiating twice, that's what the chain rule is. So imagining this almost to be like just a thing here, like a giant x or something that you're differentiating, then this would say use the power rule. So bring the three over two power in front. So it's three over two, but it's not a giant x, it's a bracket. So we leave the bracket like that, reduce the power by one. So taking one off of three over two gives us one over two. And then all the chain rule says is now multiply this, just like we did down here, and just like the rule says, multiply that to the derivative of your internal function, which was the u function over here, but we're not worrying about the u's anymore. The derivative of two minus four x is minus four, so we just get a minus four uh, on the end there like that. Maybe put that in a bracket. Okay, so notice that we've abandoned the u notation, but all that we've done is essentially the same thing. We've got a derivative here of the overall function, the outer function, multiplying that to the derivative of the internal function. We're pretty much done at that point. We've taken the derivative. It's just a case of tidying it up. You can always usually do that in the chain rule by multiplying some numbers together. So minus four times uh, three over two, that's gonna be minus 12 over two which is negative six, and then just leaving the bracket as it is with the power of one half on it. Okay, so moving on, just go straight on to the next example. Again, this guy's not in a differentiable form for a different reason this time. There's no root kicking about, but there is a fraction, and our term that we're interested in, this bracket, is on the bottom of the fraction. We need to bring it up to the top. So this is still gonna be g of x at this point. Remember here, we're not focusing on theory with the chain rule, we're focusing on typical scenarios in which you might find yourself having to apply the chain rule, but not necessarily recognizing that it's a chain rule. 
So it's about gaining the experience of these different scenarios. Okay, so this has now got a negative power, but it is still the chain rule. It is still a function inside another function. This outer function is take your thing and apply a minus three power to it. And this internal function is just a function x plus two. So there are two functions there. This is a composite function. So we need to use the chain rule. Again, I'm gonna abandon the u notation and just go with a more intuitive method which says if you want to take the derivative, you should take the derivative of the outer function first and multiply that to the derivative of the internal function. So this outer function, we use the power rule on. So we bring the power in front, we leave the bracket inside alone, reduce the power by one, so that goes down to a minus four power. Then we multiply to that the derivative of the inside. The derivative of x plus two is just one because the derivative of two is zero. The derivative of x is one. So that's just gonna be like times one on the end there. When you're multiplying something by one, obviously it doesn't change it. So we could just tidy that up by re uh, removing the one and you're gonna get a final answer like that. In this case, you might wanna change that back to a positive power. That's generally good practice. We could achieve that just by doing the opposite of what we did going from here to here by putting this back down on the bottom of the fraction. So x plus two in a bracket to the power of positive four. So that's another typical scenario. It doesn't necessarily start off looking like something you're gonna to have to use your chain rule on, but with a bit of experience, you'll recognize that even that scenario where you've got a fraction, it's still gonna be a chain rule if you've got a bracket with a power on the bracket. So I would say that generally there's two categories where you, two scenarios, two general scenarios in which you use the chain rule. One is a bracket with a power. It can be a straight up scenario like this, something more elaborate like this or like this, where you've got to do a little bit of work before it's even differentiable. And then the second scenario is around trig functions. Now quite often the trig functions are presented as having their own derivative rules. And they kind of do, and that quite often appears on a formula sheet or a table of derivatives, but actually those derivative rules are the chain rule. So for example, when you differentiate, if you take the derivative with respect to x of sine, sometimes it's written on a formula sheet as say ax, then that comes out to be a cos ax. But the reason that this a here ends up in front isn't just because that's a rule for sine, it's, the, it's because this is a chain rule. This is the function ax inside the sine function. So this is a composite function. The derivative of ax is a. So we've essentially used our rule here, our chain rule to generate the derivative of sine ax, which is a times cos ax. So those trig rules are actually the chain rule in disguise. Let's look at some other scenarios with trig functions which are more explicitly in the format so that we need to use the, the chain rule for. Because when you get something like this, for example, if I made this sine 2x, you'll probably just learn that that becomes like 2 cos 2x just by referring to a formula sheet or knowing how the sine and the cosine derivatives work and not really thinking, hey, this is actually a chain rule, just learning like this as almost as a formula. But when you move up to something like sine no longer of x or 2x or 3x, but something like x cubed, you're not gonna see that on a formula sheet. So you're gonna have to think a little more about how to differentiate this. And that's when you realize, hey, that's actually the function x cubed inside the, the sine function, that is a composite function in the same way that the whole time this was actually a composite function. I just didn't necessarily think of it as being a composite function. So we need to apply our chain rule here and we're just gonna do it in the same way as we did basically with all of these examples, regardless of the fact that it's a trig function. But what you would need to know additionally is that when you differentiate sine, you get cosine, and when you differentiate cosine, you get negative sine. So you do need to know those rules. But we can basically go straight to the derivative here. So dy dx is gonna be again, the derivative of the outer function, which is sine of something. Sine changes in differentiation to positive cosine. So it's gonna be cosine of whatever you've got inside there, x cubed. And we have to multiply to that, just like we've done again in all of these. All of these have had these two steps, take the first derivative, multiply it to the second derivative. 
The second derivative here is the derivative of the internal function x cubed, which by the power rule is 3x squared. So it comes out to be like this. This is a really common scenario. It tends to cause a lot of confusion because students are used to differentiating things that look like sine 2x or sine x or cos x, but not things like sine x cubed. So it takes a little while to adjust to the fact that that's a chain rule. This is pretty much done at this point. There's nothing to really multiply together, but convention would probably dictate that we put that 3x squared term in front and get a final answer, something like that. Okay, so look out for that one. That's another common scenario. And one final scenario I wanna look at is something like this. This one also tends to cause a lot of confusion and again, just takes a bit of experience to get used to. This is technically in a differentiable form, but I'm gonna give you a little tip here. It can be confusing to work with this notation anyway. Remember that cos cubed x or anything that looks like that, this actually means cos x all cubed. So we write cos cubed x like that to avoid thinking incorrectly about what we're doing. Because if I said to you, right, take cos x and cube it, the natural tendency would be for most students to say, right, you want me to cube this, okay? I'll cube it like that. But what this is, is actually the cosine of x cubed, which is different to the cosine of x all cubed. So what we want is the cosine of x all cubed, which is what this notation captures but it doesn't capture it explicitly, it captures it implicitly. An explicit form would be like this. Let's take the cosine of x, all cubed, which means cosine of x in a bracket with a cubed outside the bracket. So I often encourage students to change this form into this form, not because you have to, not because this is not differentiable, like this guy here is not differentiable, this has to be changed to this form really. This doesn't, but it's good practice because it allows you to now see, hey, I've got a function inside a function, so it's a composite, but also this form is more aligned to this form that we had here, here, and here. In other words, a bracket with a power. So we can now just go straight into using the chain rule to say just again, the same set of steps. We're gonna differentiate the outer function. We can do that by the power rule by bringing the three in front leave in whatever you've got in the bracket alone, reducing the power by one to make it down to a two, and then multiplying that by the derivative of the inside function. The inside function here is cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. And again, we're just basically followed the same script. All of these follow the same pattern. The outer derivative, derivative of the outer function times the internal function, the same here, same here, same here, same here just that in this one we use the more formalized notation. So again, we're pretty much done here. You just got to look for ways to potentially tidy this up. So we would probably here bring the negative in front to make it minus three. We might even bring the sine in front to go in sort of ascending powers. You might change the cosine x all squared to cosine squared x, just to put it back in the original notation, although leaving it in a bracket with a power would be fine as well. So that's also a really common scenario. So if you've already done some differentiation, then you'll probably be used to differentiating sine and cosine in these kind of basic forms, but start to explore scenarios like this and like this, which are a little bit more advanced, but you're gonna see them quite soon anyway, I would imagine. So it's good to realize early on that these are examples where you have to use the chain rule. So hopefully that helps. The main thing with the chain rule is not, like I said earlier, just knowing how to use the rule, but also knowing these different scenarios in which to look out for uh, places in which to use the rule. So these are some of the common scenarios, but not the only scenarios. There are other places out there and you'll just need to, by experience, learn to look for these composite functions and apply the chain rule. So I hope that helps. If you've got any questions or comments about this video, please leave them in the box below.